good morning everyone and uh, thank you so much for tuning in today to the monthly animal science webinar today i'm going to talk about using poultry litter in pastures and hay fields there are several topics uh, that i'm going to cover today so some of the items that i'm going to cover today is uh, what exactly is poultry litter what it is made up of okay uh, what are the benefits of litter application and then i'm going to also discuss about the risk associated with poultry litter and finally i'm going to provide a quick update on some of the research which my lab group and my students have been doing so we are i'm going to talk about the nutrient release characteristic of different types of poultry litter so let's get started first. First thing first, what is poultry litter? So poultry litter is actually a mixture of uh, fishes, uh, spilled feed, uh, water, feathers, and bedding materials. And uh, of course, uh, there are different kinds of bedding materials that are used in, uh, in, in chicken houses. Some of the common ones are peanut hulls, pine shavings, or chips. And uh, one thing to remember uh, is that the carbon to nitrogen ratios of these different kinds of bedding materials change. And, uh, you know, uh, they're very different actually. And uh, say for example, earth chips will have a much higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, and, and carbon to nitrogen ratio is important because, you know, it, it tells us that how fast or slow that particular material can decompose. So if the carbon to nitrogen ratio of a particular bedding material is high, it will decompose slowly. Uh, the other important aspect of having a bedding material is typically to kind of like uh, facilitate the quick drying of the bird droppings um, and, uh, you know, keeping the moisture to a really low level. Uh, now let's talk uh, about what exactly uh, is uh, chemical composition or what is the chemical composition of poultry feces or chicken feces. So chemically, uh, the bird dropping is, uh, you know, it is, it is comprised of uric acid, urea, ammonia, creatine, and undigested proteins. Uh, but majority is actually uric acid. Uh, almost 70% of the bird dropping is actually uh, composed of uric acid. Uh, but this uric acid is very unstable and it quickly gets converted into urea and then urea gets quickly converted into ammonia. Now, once, it's in, once ammonia is formed, it, uh, it will have two fates. Either it will volatilize or it will go through a nitrification process where the ammonia gets converted into ammonium and ammonium eventually gets converted into nitrate, uh, which are the plant, which, which is mostly the plant uh, 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 available uh, for, uh, form. So now let's talk about the benefits of poultry litter application in pasture fields or in um, row crop fields. So uh, there are multiple. Uh, the very first one is helps to improve the soil organic matter, um, you know, and of course uh, it also increases the microbial activity. Uh, it helps to build the soil structure. Um, that's really important, especially, you know, here in Alabama where we have really eroded soils. So it helps to build the soil structure and keeps the soil in place. And that also helps to prevent soil erosion or reduces the soil erosion. And uh, one of the major benefits of uh, poultry litter is uh, it saves uh, money on costly fertilizers. And we will take a look at that. Uh, what is the fertilizer value of poultry litter? So uh, we all know that poultry litter, it has three main uh, nutrients from a plant nutrition standpoint, which are, which, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So let's first calculate the nitrogen value of poultry litter, okay? So today, uh, you know, uh, urea, I mean, most, most, the most common source of nitrogen is urea. So the current prices of urea is around uh, 47 cents per pound of nitrogen. Uh, one ton of chicken litter has uh, 60 units or 60 pounds of nitrogen. Therefore, one ton of litter uh, has a fertilizer value of around $28.20, okay? 
Uh, now let's calculate the uh, the potassium value of a broiler liter. So uh, most common source again for potassium is uh, potash or muriate of potass. Um, the current prices of uh, muriate of potass is around 25 cents per pound. And one ton of litter has around 40 pounds of phosphorus, um, 40, 40 pounds of potash. Therefore one ton of litter um, has a, a potassium value of around ten dollars. So um, now let's look into the phosphorus. Okay. So the um, so say for example, um, you know we can calculate the uh, phosphorus value based on the triple superphosphate prices. Uh, so the current price of superphosphate is around forty cents per pound, and one ton of broiler litter has sixty units of phosphorus. Therefore, one ton of litter has a fertilizer value or the phosphorus fertilizer value of around $24. So summing up together, $28 for nitrogen, $10 for uh, uh, pot uh, potassium, and $24 for phosphorus. So the total value, the total nutrient value of one ton of poultry litter is $62.20. But wait a minute. Most people will argue that not all of the nutrients are available during the first year. So let's make some assumptions. Uh, let's say that 50% of the total nitrogen is available in year one, 50% of phosphorus is available in year one, and then 85% 85, 85 of potassium is available in year one. And the remaining, which we call as the residual uh, nutrients, they may be available in year two, three, or consecutive years. So let's look or calculate the fertilizer value by using these percentages. So when we do that, we see that uh, if we account for only 50% of nitrogen that is available in year first, that translates into $14.10 uh, as a nitrogen value. For phosphorus, it's $5, and for potassium, it's $20. So the, the total uh, fertilizer value of poultry litter is around $39.50 in year one. But you also remember, but do remember that, you know, the nutrient, the poultry litter does supply other micronutrients such as boron, copper, zinc, and manganese, uh, which we did not accounted for in this calculation. Uh, besides, you know, um, you know, most of the research uh, states that uh, commercial fertilizers are 50% efficient or the N uptake, uh, the nitrogen uptake efficiency is only 50%. So this means that rest of that is lost. So just from a comparison standpoint, uh, we can think uh, that uh, uh, we can compare these two different kinds of uh, fertilizer, but of course, uh, you know, uh, litter um, has uh, not, it, it not only provides nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but also supplies uh, or, or it's a source of uh, for, uh, boron, uh, copper, zinc, and manganese. Now let's talk about the risks associated with the use of poultry litter as a fertilizer. And of course, there are several risks, just like any other manure, uh, the most important risk that comes from litter application is through pathogens, uh, we are, which are Salmonella and E. coli. Uh, the other important risk, uh, I'll not say it as risk, but of course, uh, you know, um, it's it's uh, it's a challenge. Is the order, you know, litter application uh, has an order issue, and then um, you know it can create conditions of complaints from neighbors and. So of course that is considered as a challenge. And uh, one of the other challenge is uh, the repeated application of litter over several years lead to buildup of phosphorus in the soils and which can turn into uh, environmental situations of water quality, which can bring water quality problems. So these are some of the risks that are associated with poultry litter use as a fertilizer. But I'm gonna today talk or focus mostly on the nutrient buildup, especially the phosphorus buildup. So many people can think that, okay, so tell me how phosphorus application leads to buildup of phosphorus in the soil. 
So say, for example, you are a Bermuda grass hay grower and uh, your average yield is around six tons per acre. Um, the nitrogen requirements for a six ton, um, six ton of Bermuda grass hay is around 300 pounds of nitrogen. So, uh, and uh, you know, we all know that a ton of litter has 60 pounds of nitrogen. So if you are uh, putting, or if you want to meet the nitrogen requirements of your hay production, uh, you'll have to apply five tons of uh, poultry litter. So if we apply five tons of poultry litter, of course, you're applying 300 pounds of nitrogen, 300 pounds of phosphorus, and 200 pounds of potassium. Um, we also need to know that the Bermuda grass hay removes only 12 pounds of phosphorus per ton. So for a six ton uh, Bermuda grass hay, the total removal would be 72 pounds of phosphorus. All right, so now let's look, look, look up at the maths here. So we applied 300 pounds of phosphorus, right, for six tons of Bermuda grass hay. And the total plant removal or uptake was 72 pounds. So when you do the maths, the balance is around 228 pounds of phosphorus. So that amount of phosphorus stays behind in year one through application of five tons of chicken litter. And if somebody is raising Bermuda grass year after year after year and has been applying poultry litter every single year at the rate of five tons, guess what? If the soil fall previously in a medium fertility, uh, it will take four or five years for that soil to reach to a high fertility level. And, and we all know that when the soil reaches a high fertility level or when it's high for phosphorus, uh, you don't get any yield benefits. This means at that point, you know, once your soils reach to a high fertility level for phosphorus, there is no benefit of adding any phosphorus or yield benefit uh, because of the phosphorus. But uh, when uh, the phosphorus builds up in the soil, um, you know, uh, it's a challenge and um, it it can create several environmental issues, especially, uh, you know, the water quality issues. So let's, let me first talk about, you know, what are the modes through which uh, phosphorus can get into the water? So phosphorus can get into the water through three different pathways. The first one is called is erosion. Uh, when soils, uh, kind of you see like soil uh, coming out from your field in runoff water as sediments uh, that's the phosphorus is tied tied to the sediments and it comes out of your field via erosion the next category is of the next category for phosphorus transport is runoff so phosphorus is very reactive it gets dissolved in water pretty quickly and when there is like uh, severe weather and extreme rainfall events and you see like water leaving your property uh, or fill and going into the creeks uh, that's where this reactive phosphorus uh, gets into the water system the third important mode of or mechanism of phosphorus transport to water is through leaching. And this happens typically in uh, sandy soils where phosphorus moves vertically downwards. And especially when there is uh, a water table, which is really shallow or like, you know, um, you know, the phosphorus can get into that water and can contaminate the entire groundwater uh, for several years. So these are the three common transports. So one of the questions that has been asked uh, repeatedly, like, so tell me, how can we minimize this uh, excessive buildup of phosphorus in the soil? And the answer to this question is, you need to constantly monitor your soil test phosphorus levels. Uh, you know, uh, because that's the only way to know whether you are running into the danger zone of having a uh, high phosphorus. Uh, and if you if you see that your soil test levels are really high for phosphorus, 
it's always a good idea to stop applying litter for a few years and then supply the nitrogen and potassium demands using the commercial fertilizer. So, or alternatively, you can rotate between your commercial fertilizer and your uh, poultry litter, and this this way it will delay uh, or actually reduce the risk of phosphorus loss into the environment. Uh, next, I will talk about uh, the research that we have been doing in our lab, and this is research for from one of my graduate students who is studying the release characteristic of phosphorus, but also different nutrients. So in her work, uh, we, cl we collected different poultry litter samples and we classified in them into three different categories. The first category is the fresh litter. The second one is the caked litter. And the third one is called as composted or aged litter. So fresh litter uh, is the litter that uh, is collected after six months or probably like, you know, after four or five flocks, uh, you know, when the growers clean out their houses. So that's the kind of litter which we are calling it as fresh litter. Then the other category is cake litter, which where, you know, uh, growers remove or decay uh, after two years uh, and then, then remove it. So that is the decay litter, uh, cake litter. And the third category is the compost where the litter has been stored in the pile for a couple of years. It stays there and is undergoing the natural composting process. So that's what we call as the ACE litter. So we are studying the phosphorus and other nutrient release characteristic of these three different kinds of litter. So let me provide you a brief uh, background about what are the different kinds or forms of phosphorus that are present in any poultry litter. So, you know, in pol whenever we send a poultry litter samples, we always get the total phosphorus analysis. But total phosphorus analysis is actually comprised of several different categories of fo or forms of phosphorus. And the important forms are, there are three important forms. One is called as dissolved reactive phosphorus, DRP. And these are like uh, mostly plant available phosphorus, you know, like orthophosphorus or pyro or metaphosphates. The second form of phosphorus that is present in litter is called as dissolved non-reactive phosphorus. So this form of phosphorus is not accessible by the plants, but it is accessible to the microbes. And uh, microbes can break these when they need them. And, and some of the common dissolved forms of non-reactive phosphorus are lipids or DNA or RNAs, uh, which are out um, you know, in the environment, in the natural soil solution. Um, then the third part is uh, it's called as the recalcitrant organic phosphorus. And this form or pool of phosphorus is very hard to break. I mean, it takes a, quite a bit of energy by the microbes to break these, and it's very slow to decompose, um, so very slow to degrade or de decompose. So most of the phosphorus that is available to plants is the dissolved reactive P and the dissolved non-reactive P, whereas the recalcitrant phosphorus is a very uh, stable kind of phosphorus that stays uh, in the soil for a long period of time. So uh, for, for in this particular experiment, we studied the uh, release characteristic of these three different forms. So the most important form is the dissolved reactive phosphorus, okay? Um, so again, uh, a little bit about a background about our materials and methods. So we collected these different kinds of litter from houses, poultry houses in different parts of the state in Alabama. And then we conducted a WAS experiment in the laboratory where we washed. Uh, we did a repeated extraction of phosphorus um, from this poultry litter and then we analyzed it for uh, the, uh, all these three different categories, uh, which were the reactive, the dissolved reactive, the dissolved non-reactive, and the recalcitrant organic P. So let's first, uh, we can also think about, you know, about, uh, you know, say for example, a producer applies poultry litter, okay? And when there is a series of rainfall, especially like when we enter into the winter month, uh, you know, we see like, 
uh, a series of rainfall events. So say for example, the farmer applied poultrilator and then the first, and after he applies, we got the first rain. So how much phosphorus can we expect that, uh, you know, that will be released from the poultrilator? Then also how much phosphorus can we expect that would be released during the second rainfall event and third and fourth and so on and so forth. So that's how we are trying to mimic this or trying to understand the release rates of different kinds of phosphorus uh, under different rainfall events. So this is a graph that tells the, the release characteristic of the dissolved reactive phosphorus. Remember, I just mentioned that the dissolved reactive phosphorus is the phosphorus form which is readily available or accessible to the plants. So, uh, and we are comparing and contrasting the release rates of these three different kinds of poultry litter. One is six months old litter, the cake litter, and the compost litter. What we see here, a very interesting finding here is that the release rates of the release rate of phosphorus differs between these three kinds of litter. And, and um, actually the, the, the cake litter releases the most uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus in, in the first wash cycle or the first rainfall event uh, compared to the six months old litter or a composted litter. Uh, the other important uh, thing to note is like this release rate follows uh, exponential decay order, meaning that initially it releases the phosphorus fast. And as we move on or as with subsequent rainfall events, uh, this release rate uh, decrease down uh, or slows down considerably. So most of the phosphorus, as you can see, is released during the first, second, third and fourth uh, rainfall events or wash cycles. After fourth, you know, the, the, the amount as well as the release rate uh, decreases down uh, considerable, considerably. So now let's look into the percentages. Let's talk in terms of percentage of like how much of the reactive phosphorus was released compared to the total phosphorus content uh, in the litter. So what we see here is in the first wash cycle or first rainfall event, uh, six month old litter released 14% of the total P as the plant up level or the dissolved reactive P. Uh, whereas compost litter, they released 21% of the total phosphorus amount. Um, uh, and then, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the one to three year old or cake litter released 21%, whereas compost released 12% of, uh, of the total phosphorus uh, as a dissolved reactive P. Uh, an interesting feature is that, uh, of course, the cake litter has the highest amount of phosphorus that is released during the first wash cycle or first rainfall event. And as we go, and then with consecutive wash cycles or rainfall event, you can see here that these percentages drop down, but the significant drop happens after the fourth cycle. So basically, you know, after the fourth rainfall event, uh, you know, only 1.68 or 1.1 or 1% 1 of phosphorus is released as dissolved reactive P or out of the total phosphorus. Um, um, the same same principle applies to the six months old litter as well. You can see here that the percentage of uh, the reactive P falls down significantly, and especially after fourth cycle, there is not much phosphorus or just a uh, very less amount of phosphorus that is released after the fourth uh, rainfall event. Um, we also looked into the distribution of different P forms. So remember, like we classified our total phosphorus into a dissolved reactive phosphorus, dissolved non-reactive phosphorus, and then the recalcitrant phosphorus or the residual phosphorus, which is very difficult to break down. What we observed here is that in lit the compost, uh, sorry, the, the, the cake litter, you know, 46% of the nitrogen is present as a reactive phosphorus, whereas 54% is present as, as a recalcitrant organic uh, phosphorus. 
but in six months or later we are getting less of the total reactive phosphorus and more of a residual phosphorus or recalcitrant phosphorus and same principle applies to compost so it's quite uh, you know you can imagine that out of the total phosphorus only 46 percent uh, gets released and is available to the plant uh, you know whereas the remaining like 54 percent is is not available to the plants and it's actually not even and it's very hard to degrade or decompose them so uh, the rule of thumb here is like whatever the phosphorus uh, percentage is almost like 40 to 45 percent is only the reactive phosphorus that would be available to the plants whereas the rest is a recalcitrant form and that will not be available to the plants and uh, it's very hard to uh, degrade them as well uh, now let's talk about the potassium release characteristics of litter and potassium release is very different than phosphorus in potassium what we observe is that most of the potassium is released right after the first rainfall or first wash cycle um, but uh, after second you don't see any action basically so most of the potassium is released after the first rainfall and second rainfall events third and fourth you don't see any or very little amount of potassium that would be released from poultry litter that tells me that potassium is present in a highly dissolved state and it easily gets it's easily released uh, after the rainfall event and uh, of course we see the differences as well uh, most of the potassium is re is released uh, uh, or a higher amount of potassium is released from a uh, cake litter uh, whereas the compost releases the least amount of potassium so this is very interesting here that the amount of potassium that is present in compost or a aged litter is very low compared to a fresh litter or like a cake litter and their release rates are also very low now the other question is what are the other nutrients besides phosphorus and potassium that gets released during these rainfall events and we found that some of the major uh, nutrients are sulfur magnesium calcium and aluminum but sulfur is the one that is released at the highest rate among all these three different litter types the next one is the magnesium and again you know it's so important especially in in pasture fields because you know we often think about the magnesium tetany situation but poultry litter application and rainfall does help to actually release uh, magnesium um, in the soil solution and that is available to the plants um, um, and uh, yeah so 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 looking at all these uh, different release rates of uh, nutrients uh, it really helps us to think about the timing of litter application because you apply the litter and if it rains the next day and you haven't planted your crop or or, or the forage is not growing you know uh, all the nutrients that is released after the first rainfall basically is is lost so it's very important to time the litter application um, and and you know again the percentage of nitrogen phosphorus and potassium uh, that will be utilized by the forage uh, in the first year will basically depend on the type of pasture that is present. I mean, is it a cool season pasture or is it a warm season grass, okay? Um, I mean, this is a chart that tells you the relative growth rate of a winter annual or a cool season or a perennial uh, grass, warm season perennial grass. So it makes us think that if you are uh, growing a cool season perennial grass and the maximum peak or the peak of biomass production is between April and May, uh, we should time our litter application sometimes uh, between, uh, between um, you know, early January or like early, uh, sorry, late January um, mid-January to early February time period uh, so that we can match the demand here uh, for the cool season but again like there are two cycles here you know I mean we see a little bit of growth again back from October November time period so we can consider a second application probably here in the August uh, time frame 
uh, when it comes to warm season uh, perennial grasses uh, i feel like the best timing of application is march to early april uh, march to early april time period because that's the time period when the plant demand increases so I believe like, you know, if we time our uh, little application close to March or April, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, there'll be a better utilization of the nutrients that is uh, released. But again, keep in mind, we have to also think about, you know, the rainfall events and, you know, in context of when the litter was applied and when the rainfall occurred. Uh, so all these things go into the decision of like when to apply um, a little. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. And, uh, you know, um, I hope that you have learned something new about the, uh, the way the litter releases nutrients. Um, and, uh, of course, we post uh, some of these interesting topics time to time at our Facebook page. So do check us out at uh, this Facebook link um, and thank you all for being here today.